everybody. Happy Saturday morning. Definitely in the right place. This is majoring in media, college and beyond. We're about to get started. One more minute. Let a few more people get in on the conversation. All right, let's let's get started. Um, welcome, welcome everybody. This is a NADA Chicago Midwest Junior Board event called Majoring in Media College and Beyond. My name is John Owens. I'm the president of the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences Chicago Midwest chapter. And we're gonna start the conversation in just a few minutes. I wanted to begin by letting you know that we're gonna open up the floor for questions later in the event. So if you do have questions, look at the bottom of your screen. There's a Q and A uh, uh, prompt, a Q and A field, and that's where you'll submit your questions and the panelists can answer your questions either uh, through writing or through a verbal response. So. Definitely, if you have questions, use that Q&A field to submit your questions. Um, and also, I'd like to alert you to uh, scholarships that Natis offers on an annual basis to high school students. We usually offer up to three $2,500 scholarships, and we're doing that again this year for the 2022-2023 academic year for high school seniors heading to college in the fall in the fall of 2022. The deadlines are coming up though. It's up March 18th for the deadline. So if you wanna apply, uh, go to our website at chicagoemeonline.org to apply. It's something that we do every March. And so you juniors on the call, remember, we'll offer these scholarships again next year. And then also I'd like to uh, let you know about a podcast that the junior board that's sponsoring this event produces called The Pursuit. And that's where junior board members conduct in-depth interviews with notable broadcasters and journalists in our chapter. This is something you, uh, if you have a chance to listen to these podcasts, because they're great. They're one hour podcast and they're available on our website. Again, that's chicagoemlyonline.org. And they're also on Apple and Spotify and other platforms. So it's definitely a great listen. And the junior board, which is sponsoring this event, they produce the pr uh, pursuit. Uh, they're comprised of students and young professionals in our chapter age 18 to 26. One mission of our junior board is to connect with future members of our broadcast and communication fields, like you high school students out there interested in a media career, starting with finding a college. And that's what this seminar is all about. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our two moderators for our event, and they can introduce you to the panelists, uh, major in media, college and beyond. And so without further ado, here they are, both members of the Natus Junior Board, Lauren Yacino, and Ronan Morrissey. Hi, uh, thank you all again for coming. It's really great uh, to see a lot of people come out for this. And again, thank you to the panelists for taking time out to participate in this. We really appreciate it. Um, so to kind of get started, uh, some of our, the panelists that are here today uh, were uh, greeted by Lee Hood, who is an associate professor of broadcast news at Loyola, Loyola University. Um, Gary Novak, DePaul University School of Cinematic Arts Director and also a filmmaker. Uh, Christian Pekaski, Associate Professor of Cinema and Television Arts uh, at Columbia College, Chicago. Larry Stupnagel, Associate Professor at Northwestern University. And Lisa Trout, Neuqua Valley High School's Department Chair for Media, TEE, FACS, and past president and current secretary for the Midwest Media Educators Association. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming. Before we get started with the panel, I just wanna remind all students that the Outreach Committee has also created a resource guide for you guys that's currently up on the Natus website. I'm going to pop a link to it in chat right now. There you go. And this resource guide is going to be a great thing for you guys to look at and to help you kind of go about this whole college decision process. The first part kind of compares what you like to do in class projects with the careers in media that would 
go with those types of passions and interest. And then we have a list of a bunch of colleges and universities in the Midwest that offer programs in media, whether that be journalism, broadcast, film, television, et cetera. And then the end of the resource guide is a whole list of resources. So we have free software, websites, YouTube channels, videos, competitions, internships, everything that you can imagine that could help you kind of do a deep dive into what you want to learn and what you want to study and how to get started right now. Uh, so it'd be awesome if you guys check that out and see if it helps. Um, so with that being said, um, if you have any questions that come up during this panel, please pop it in that Q&A section and around 11, we'll have a Q&A with our panelists and we'll try to answer all the questions you guys have. Uh, so to start off with our first section, we're going to talk about the background of all of our panelists. So panelists, I would like you guys to describe your career path in media and how you decided what you wanted to do and how you kind of got there. So uh, Gary, let's start with you. Uh, my path is um, <laughs> kind of convoluted. Um, I, I initially wanted to be a uh, astronomer going into high school because I'm old enough that I actually remember seeing the uh, the moon landing live, <laughs> uh, Neil Armstrong, the whole thing. And then in high school, just because I was interested in it, I started working in a high school radio station. I went to, to Maine South and uh, still intending to be a, a, an astronomer. And then I ran into chemistry and physics and thought, well, if I wanted to go into science, I'm going to have a lot more classes like this. And I thought now is probably a good time to pivot. And I was thinking what else I was going to do. And one of the things that occurred to me was I was doing radio. So I thought, hey, hey about broadcasting. So instead of going to Northwestern as an astronomy major, I went as a radio TV film major um, and uh, kind of morphed from like radio to TV to by the time I got out, I was doing film. I worked in local production in the uh, 80s, uh, doing um, what you would do back in the 80s, you know, commercials, corporate videos, that kind of stuff. And I got, I realized that to me, it wasn't just the process, it was the product that mattered. And I was at the time making like videos on how to make dentures, uh, how to make screws, I mean, that, that, that was big in the 80s, those kind of videos. And um, I decided that uh, maybe I needed to shift. So uh, I worked, I, I managed to get a job in cable. This was local cable. And back in the 80s, if you were breathing, you could get a job in cable. That may still be the case now, but back in the 80s, we were doing local production. So I started doing local production. That morphed into uh, a job in, in Washington, D.C. I ended up working at C-SPAN for a bit. Um, got really tired. Got really tired of doing that, and uh, went back to Chicago. Did production for a bit, and then decided to go to grad school. And I went to uh, the American Film Institute as a screenwriting major, and then graduated. Spent some time in LA, and then ended up uh, in Chicago in the early two thousands. And I decided I wanted to do. Uh, something else besides local production. And I already toyed with teaching. So I applied for a job at DePaul and the rest is history, as they say. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, how about Kristen, how about you go? Well, my story is also a little convoluted. I, I think I had a sense that I might wanna go into some aspect of television or at least journalism. Um, people had always tagged me as a creative person and I competed in speech and debate and did a lot of writing um, and I wanted to have some kind of impact on the world. So those are the things that I knew as of high school. And when I went to college, um, I started out majoring in, in journalism. And in an early class, I had a professor who basically talked me out of it. He gave us this speech about how it was such a competitive field and would be very difficult to get a job. And we were going to have to, you know, be amazing and work super hard. And that really intimidated me out of pursuing that as a career. And so I kind of, I downshifted my ideals a little bit to thinking about, you know, sort of maybe corporate communications or public relations or something like that. Um, I ended up getting a job as a press secretary for a politician um, and speechwriter when I graduated, which seemed really exciting and interested. And then I quickly realized that maybe that wasn't the way to change the world. Um, and so then I did the communications thing for a while. Um, 
got a very lucky opportunity to make a documentary for one of my clients doing a big public service campaign on substance abuse. Um, and that won an Emmy. And that's when I realized, you know, most of the communication stuff, I didn't find it to be all that challenging and interesting. But in the world of documentary, I felt like it was super interesting, um, super challenging. I felt like I would always be learning new things and having new experiences. And so ironically, I ended up essentially going into one of the more difficult fields of journalism, um, went back to grad school, got a degree in documentary, and have been making um, film and television documentaries ever since. Awesome. Um, how about Lisa, you go next. Good morning. Mine, uh, my trek, I think, is also a little convoluted. I feel like that's going to be a common message from all of us this morning. Um, grew up in Libertyville, and while I was at Libertyville High School, did take a TV class there. Then went on to Augustana College and actually started majoring in technical theater was my initial major. And it, uh, while I was there, I decided to add journalism or television as uh, another major, but they didn't have it at the time. So I worked with uh, a wonderful professor there, David Snowball, and we were able to kind of create and put together a major that didn't exist yet. So I took classes across the river, uh, at a different college, a few classes that we made up at Augustana um, and ended up double majoring, but then also had an internship at the NBC affiliate in Davenport, Iowa, KWQC TV. And that's where I really learned a lot. And I worked behind the scenes from doing the teleprompter to camera and then eventually moved up and worked full time while I was in college uh, doing a production assistant. So master control operator, audio, tech directing, um, graphics, pretty much anything and everything I was doing. Left there after uh, a number of years and got into doing this teaching thing at my alma mater. Uh, enjoyed that, but missed television. So went back into the industry and worked at CLTV, Chicagoland Television when it was in Oak Brook. And while I was there, had the opportunity to leave there and head out to Connecticut and help to launch ESPN News and worked for ESPN out in Connecticut for a number of years doing graphics. I was an infinite operator. Um, and for those that don't know what that is, it's pretty much doing all the text, all the character generator stuff that goes along. When you see stats come up on the bottom of a screen for a player, I was typing that in. So I had the chance to travel across the country doing all sorts of different sporting events and being a huge sports fan, um, this was ideal. Uh, but after a number of years left, ESPN moved back to the Chicago area and got back into teaching because there was something about it that I missed. And so ever since I've come back, I've been teaching at the high school level. I freelanced for a number of years after coming back from ESPN for ESPN, CBS Sports, ABC Sports, Fox Sports, you name it, whoever was going to pay me um, and hire me. I worked for them. So I got to do a number of events while I was still teaching. And then after it became uh, a bit too much, I left the freelancing world and stuck with teaching. So this is my 26th year of teaching high school students uh, all about television and what that's all about. And here at Nequa Valley in Naperville, Illinois, we have uh, a wonderful media program where students can learn all about the production end of things. So behind the scenes, they can learn about filmmaking, documentaries, short films, doing commercials, PSAs, and then as well as journalism. Uh, we produce a weekly news program and things like that. So that's my background. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Larry, how about you go next? There we go. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I realized when I was in high school that I wanted to be a journalist. Uh, I worked on the campus newspaper as a reporter. And then uh, by the time I graduated, I was also a columnist along with being a reporter. Uh, <clears throat> when I went to college, uh, I, was, I started off wanting to be a print reporter, a newspaper reporter, but I didn't get along with the uh, editor of the paper. And so uh, we just clashed on a number of things. And about that same time, uh, the local university, California State University, Chico, uh, got a license to be a public radio station. 
And so they needed a news director for the radio station. I said, I can do that. And so I did. And um, that led to my being the news director there for a couple of years. Among the people that I interviewed then were then Governor Ronald Reagan um, and Duke Ellington. And so doing that led to my being, and I went to a lot of events, spent a lot of time covering stories, and that led to the local, um, the Chico Reading Market, this small market TV, which is where a lot of you are going to start. And so the stringer for the Reading TV station uh, was getting ready to graduate from the university, and he'd seen me at so many different news events that he recommended me for the job. And so I took it and I go back, um, Gary, I think we're probably about the same generation. Um, I go back to when you were shooting film to do a story. And so this is way before cell phones. This is a way before, you know, stations having microwaves set up in, in that kind of a small market. So every story I shot had to make the 220 Greyhound bus to Reading to where they could take it up there process the film, put it on their newscast. That led to me being hired straight out of college by Channel 12 in Chico. And so while I was there, I was there for eight years. And while I was there, I uh, did everything from radio drive time news to uh, TV reporter, to news director, to anchor producer for the local newscasts. And that was also where I met my wife. And we, she's an academic, we're both, uh, she's also at Northwestern. And uh, Betsy got an offer from the University of Pennsylvania. So we packed up and moved across the country and I ended up working for uh, New Jersey Public Television and WNET, the uh, PBS station in New York, where I became a political correspondent, had a, um, uh, weekly Sunday interview show. I was a backup anchor um, and won a couple of regional Emmys back there. And then uh, in 1995, we were both offered jobs at Northwestern University. And I've been there for 26 years now. Cool, thank you so much. And last but not least, Lee. So uh, in some ways, my start was similar to Larry's. I, I knew from the time I was a freshman in high school that I wanted to be a journalist. And uh, I was making money. I, I worked as a professional journalist from the time I was 15 years old. Uh, when I turned 16 and had the chance to be able to drive to the newspaper office, that made it a little bit easier. Uh, and then when I got to college, I started doing radio and uh, then television. Uh, I graduated from the University of Missouri and uh, then worked as a news producer for many years, but I have done everything in television except for chroma key weather. Uh, my avocation is sports. I grew up uh, really loving sports, and so I've covered sports, I've covered uh, news, uh, and um, I've reported, I've been the videographer, the editor, and uh, mostly the producer, and uh, worked for many years in Denver. Uh, at some point, I decided that I wanted to have more of a personal life outside of, of daily news, and so uh, went to graduate school at the University of Colorado, but uh, continued to produce newscasts um, and write newscasts as a freelancer uh, clear through the time that I worked on my master's degree and my PhD. And um, I loved working in news so much that I would have done it for free if uh, I didn't have bills to pay. So I really, really loved my time in journalism. And um, 13 years ago, I uprooted my family from Colorado and moved them here so that I could help uh, start a broadcast journalism program at Loyola. And uh, here we are all these years later. Awesome. Thank you guys for sharing your backgrounds. I think that's 
always really helpful for students to sort of hear, you know, where everyone's, you know, professionals like you start from and sort of know that everyone's path is different. And, you know, while many of you sort of have like similar, you know, careers and stuff, how you got there is always different. So it's always great to, you know, hear that. And I think it's helpful for students to kind of see that. Um, so to kind of get into more of like some of the questions that we sort of uh, developed, um, the first one that uh, I think we're going to toss to each of you, um, television, journalism, film, and broadcasting, you know, can be such broad terms that cover a multitude of career paths and, you know, specialties. Uh, could each panelist sort of give an overview of the types of, you know, majors that their universities offer and maybe sort of kind of like see the differences between the two. Uh, we'll kind of start backwards. So Lee, if you kind of want to kick off that one. Okay, so at Loyola, uh, we have two majors that would be probably most applicable to what we're talking about, multimedia journalism and film. Uh, so in multimedia journalism, um, one of my beliefs is that the more things you can do the more options you have. So for instance, I teach a technology for journalism class in which I have them maintain uh, their own blogs where they have to write every week. They also have to learn how to do still photography, video photography, uh, edit audio, do information graphics, that sort of thing. So I, I just feel like, the more opportunity you get to try different things, you not only see, yes, I can do these various skills, but also find what you like the best if there's something that you wanna specialize in. Uh, so that's our journalism program. And then we also have a film program for those who feel like they would, would uh, gravitate more to either feature films or documentaries. Uh, uh, for our documentary students, they actually, some of them are journalism majors and some of them are film majors. So there's, there's definitely some crossover uh, in that way. I hope that helps. Awesome. Yeah, it does. Uh, Larry? At Medill, uh, well, at Northwestern University, there's the Medill School uh, where, and I'm on the journalism side on it, but we have a, a, a mass media and, and uh, a public relations sort of aspect to it. But in, within Medill itself, we believe, like a lot of schools do these days, that we're all multimedia journalists these days. You have to be, at least have a rudimentary knowledge of how to do a podcast, how to produce a documentary, how to, um, how to do a newscast, how to, how to do a news show. And so what we're doing there is in your freshman year, your first year, as a first year student, you take multimedia reporting classes. You start off with a foundation of doing uh, street reporting, even in your first year. Excuse me, just a second. I've got to let my dog out of my office here. He was, he's making a little bit of, oh, there we go. He's gone. Uh, sorry about that. He's a big German shepherd and makes a lot of noise. Um, in your first year, we have two sections of classes where you start off with just the fundamentals of reporting and you hit the streets reporting in the streets of Evanston second quarter in our multimedia reporting that's when you start doing you start dabbling with uh, shooting video and using your iPhones or you and you also start to, uh, doing podcasts and that sort of thing and from there you can uh, expand to uh, really specifically going into the area you want to do if you want to be a multimedia reporter but you don't want to do television news, but you want to do more explainer type of things like you see in the Washington Post or on Vox. Uh, we have classes that specialize in that. I teach a class on broadcast uh, news writing and reporting where you learn the fundamentals of how to produce a newscast, how to put a show together, how to have it work out on time, how to manage a team. I break my classes up into uh, three teams where people alternate their responsibilities. Uh, beyond that, we teach courses in journalism ethics. You know, what's, what's right, what's wrong? What, where do you draw the line these days? 
uh, with all of the fake news out there and how do you help people understand your real news uh, versus uh, some of the other stuff that, that's being produced. So that is in, uh, in a nutshell what McGill is doing. You also have magazine reporting, newspaper reporting, but it's all online uh, geared toward that really. The Com Studies program that Northwestern has, uh, which is separate from Medill, but now we're getting closer together and collaborating more, is uh, they, have, they also do documentaries, but they also produce feature-like films and feature-like things. And then they delve more deeply into the uh, communication studies areas. So that is a quick nutshell view of what Medill and uh, Northwestern University has to do. It's very easy for somebody in Medill to double major. Uh, I have a dual appointment in political science and uh, I have a lot of students who are double majors in Medill political science who have gone on to do things like be an associate producer for Chuck Todd right now. And um, that happens because you're going to have general education requirements in when you go to college in most schools and Medill's general education requirements match those of the Weinberg College of Art and Sciences. So it makes it easier to, to double major if you wanna do that. Yeah, that's really awesome to, to know. Um, uh, Kristen. So um, at Columbia College, we also have a lot of different programs and departments that deal with media. It really depends on what your area of focus is. Um, I'm gonna put a link in the chat to the School of Media Arts at Columbia. Um, that's where all of our media departments are located. There are four different departments under that banner, uh, audio arts, film and television, communications, which includes journalism and interactive arts. Um, audio arts is just what it sounds like. If you're really serious about sound, whether that be sound for film and television or podcasting, that's the department for you. Film and television covers literally every single genre you could imagine on film and TV. Um, we have a particularly strong documentary program and focus there as well as um, I would say cinematography and writing, including writing for comedy are real strengths at Columbia. Um, but that runs the gamut. Um, in our communications department, we have journalism programs. So if you know you wanna do news, that might be the department for you. And like Medill, you would start with fundamental reporting skills, but you would learn multimedia reporting and there's a whole broadcast stream there. So if you're somebody who wants to, to be a producer for broadcast news or on-air talent, um, you can do that in the communications department. Interactive arts um, does a lot of game design, but also that's where our animation and special effects and motion graphics people are located. So if you really want to do animation for TV, that's the place for you. Um, we have interdisciplinary documentary work. And as I mentioned, a lot of documentary faculty that are really high level doing, you know, Emmy award winning um, work for film and television. That's a real strength. Um, we offer all manner of screenwriting, um, starting from writing the short film to TV arts writing, serialized, sketch comedy, drama, etc. cetera. Um, I don't think there's any aspect of media that you can't study at um, Columbia. It really sort of depends on what your area of focus is. For news, I would suggest definitely taking a close look at the communications program. Um, and for everything else, probably film and television. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and Gary. Okay, I'm uh, at DePaul, I run the, um, or the director, I don't know if I run it. <laughs> I'm the, the figurehead of the School of Cinematic Arts. And uh, I also just out of sheer luck was one of the people that started the film program at, at DePaul uh, in 2003. So I've kind of been with the program from the beginning. And we, there's kind of two kind of mantras that we've had from day one. Um, one is when we were creating the program, we always said to ourselves, if we were going to film school today, what would we like that program to look like? What would we like the courses to be, the faculty, the facilities, uh, based on our experience in, in the industry, as well as our experience in, you know, at other institutions? You know, we've taken the best of all possible worlds and kind of cramming it into the fall. And the other uh, kind of module we've had from, from the very beginning 
is the, the idea that the best way to learn how to, to, to make films and television is to make them and make lots of them, right? So our philosophy has always been get the, the, the equipment into, into the hands of the students as soon as possible. So we have fall quarter freshmen in, in major classes. Uh, some universities, you know, you, 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 you uh, take a lot of gen eds before you get to the majority of the major courses. In our case, it's fall quarter. Logic being more time making stuff, the better you're going to be at it. And I always tell students the other advantage is, you know, after two quarters, you may hate filmmaking and never want to be on another set. Better to find that out sooner <laughs> rather than when you're a senior so you can go transfer to something else. Within the School of Cinematic Arts, we have the film and television program and we have our animation program. Um, we've been fortunate that the, uh, the School of Cinematic Arts was ranked uh, number 16 by the, the Hollywood Reporter this past year, so was Columbia College. It was not 16, but they're ranked by the Hollywood Reporter. We were also, we've been ranked uh, for the last few years as a top film program by Variety. And um, in terms of uh, the film and television side, uh, the, the really kind of centerpiece of our, uh, our, of our program, kind of the marquee aspect of it, is our facility at uh, Cinespace Chicago Film Studios. We have a 35,000 square foot uh, facility out there, which is four sound stages. Uh, it's smack dab in the middle of, of the lot. And if you don't know what Cinespace is, it's where the local, the hub of local production, at least on the episodic side. So all the Dick Wolf Chicago shows are shot out there. Empire, when it was shooting, was shooting out there. HBO, Netflix, uh, FX, everybody is, is shooting out there. They're also expanding. When, when we first, well, when I first started doing this, uh, as, as director, I've been director from the beginning a few years ago, there were 30 some odd stages out there. Uh, when Empire left, they started subdividing and expanding. Now they're going to have about 60 stages out there. Uh, and our students basically take all their production classes at Cinespace. So you're taking your production classes on, on what's a, a working soundstage. On top of it, our students, when they walk into our stages, are, are going past uh, Chicago Fire and Chicago PD to get to our stages. So it is very much a kind of, you're going to learn how things are actually done in the industry. Um, with As far as the areas you can study, um, within our BFA in film and TV, we have 11 concentrations. So it's pretty much every craft in filmmaking you can think of. Uh, you know, directing, screenwriting, cinematography, sound design, editing, the list goes on. Probably a couple worth noting that kind of stand out compared to some other schools. One would be we have a showrunner concentration, which uh, if you're not familiar with what showrunning is, is in, in film kind of the, the main creative visionary or voice in, in a project is, is a lot of times the director. In television, the directors are hired hands. They, they, they bump, bop from series to series, they'll direct a couple of episodes, but the person is kind of responsible for the tone, the tenor to make sure that every episode of a series looks like it's part of that series is the showrunner. And, and we are showing in concentration students, it's a combination of production classes as well as screenwriting classes, because that's basically kind of the background of most, most showrunners. And uh, another one it, worth, worth mentioning, it's, it's not, um, unusual, it's a visual effects concentration, but we're really starting to expand that. Um, and one of the things we're starting to get into this year is virtual production. And I don't know if you're familiar with virtual production, but it's, it is the latest version of uh, kind of CGI, but instead of uh, green screen where you have an actor kind of acting in limbo, imagining something there, the green screen has been replaced with LED walls and with a projection on it. So you can actually see, the actors can actually see the environment that they're in and interact with it in real time. It's actually fascinating technology because it's also run on game engines. So it's this convergence of different approaches to things. And the last thing I wanna kind of point out that may not be uh, self-explanatory is we have a comedy filmmaking concentration uh, in, in the BFA, which is actually a, a joint degree with uh, Second City. So our students uh, take classes at DePaul uh, they take classes at our facility at Cinespace, but they also take uh, comedic improv classes up at Second City, taught by the Second City improv instructors. And, and this degree is not a, a performance degree, even though you can probably take the skills if you got it and um, start your own uh, uh, improv troupe. But really the point of the degree is to take Second City's approach to, to improv uh, and use it for ideation, working on scripts, working with actors and working on set. So it's kind of a behind the the camera degree. 
So that's the film and TV side. On the animation side, uh, it's a top animation program. It was just recently ranked 18 by the, Acad by the Animation Career Review, which is one of the big ranking uh, bodies when it comes to animation programs. We have multiple concentrations in uh, animation, anything from 3D and game art to traditional uh, 2D animation. Um, the uh, other thing I was gonna mention um, in terms of, we, we do have a, a journalism program at, at DePaul, but that's actually in the College of Communication. Uh, we also have a radio station at DePaul, which is also in the College of Communication. So uh, the DePaul is interesting in that, you know, the film and TV and uh, animation is in one school while some of the other media is in, in communication. And some of that has just to do with uh, the way this, the program has developed over the years at, uh, at DePaul. So that's kind of DePaul in a, in a nutshell. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, so moving on to our next topic, I remember when I was in high school and looking at all of the different colleges out there and what they like, have to offer, I kind of felt spoiled for choice in a sense where I'm like, what, what do I even decide? What do I do? So for high school students now looking at all these universities here and, and beyond, what qualities of a university's degree program should students consider when looking to apply? Um, I feel like Lisa, you could maybe talk to, since you work with high school students every day, kind of their thoughts and what, what things should they really be looking at when, when deciding on a school? One of the first things when a student comes to me to say, hey, I don't even know what I wanna do after school is, I first ask them, do you want a traditional school or do you want a non-traditional school? Cause there's a number of schools out there uh, that they can get into that are 18 month, two year type programs um, to get into the industry. But a lot of students want that traditional, traditional college feel, that traditional program. So once they decide that, then we usually say to them, what type of school do you want? Do you want a small, tiny little school? Like I went to Augustana and it was 25, 2600 students. Or do you want a bigger school like a Northwestern? Uh, that's a big 10 school. Do you want that huge, big atmosphere? And so then they kind of have to figure that out and then also where, and then the type of program they want. And as much as they can see these programs online and see virtual tours of them, nothing beats setting foot on that campus and getting a true feel for what it's like. So we encourage them to walk around that campus, talk to people, as well as sit in on classes, talk to people there, see if you can pop in on a class it gives you a feel for the students that are there. It gives you a feel for the professors that are there, the interaction that you have, as well as the experiences. Um, because the tour guides are going to be, hey, go to our school, go to our school. But the students that are really in those classes are really going to be able to give the students uh, some great feedback of, yeah, this is a great program, or it's not quite what I thought. Here's what I ended up doing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a little bit of the advice we give high schoolers. And then um, our other panelists from the universities, anyone could jump in here. What, what do you feel that students should look for when I, applying? I think that's great, uh, that last advice you got. Visit the school, sit in on classes. If there are extracurriculars that the students can visit, uh, by all means do that. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, Medill does is that I neglected to mention was how much, what are the opportunities outside of the classroom that you can do? Uh, Gary, you, you have a tremendous number of outside places where you, where you send people for students to learn. Medill also has a journalism residency program. Every student who goes to Medill can go to a local TV station, say. Um, I have a student right now who's become a, uh, trusted intern for Andrea Mitchell at MSNBC for her show. And so the outside, you know, the extracurriculars you can do, how much hands-on reporting you're going to be able to do, and the ability to get out into the professional world where you not only get valuable experience, but great connections. Yeah, the other thing I, I would, you know, I, I, I agree with everything that, that's been said. Uh, other things at least you, you want to think about is uh, in terms of uh, their uh, access to equipment policy. I mean, again, it goes back to my philosophy of you got to make a lot of stuff to be good at it. What, what is the policy, you know, in terms of accessing gear? Uh, at DePaul, students can, 
make projects, you know, they're class assignments, but we also encourage students to make projects outside of class. And we have a, a, a structure in place to help students do that so they can get gear access, insurance coverage to make kind of their, their passion project on weekends or over spring break or something like that. So it's the gear access. I think it's also um, the other thing to really think about is, um, I, and, and it was mentioned in the chat that, um, you know, Columbia gets people in, you know, hit the ground running in the major and, and DePaul does too. I think that's good as well, as opposed to, I got to take gen eds for two years before I get the privilege of, uh, of touching the gear. Um, a side note, when, when we started the program at DePaul, you know, this was very early in the digital revolution of filmmaking, right? We was um, back in 2003, if you said digital cinema to anybody, most people would think projection. Everything was still primarily being shot on, on film. Um, when you got the post, it may get digital, but it was all shot on film. But when we were thinking of this program, one of the promises of digital uh, was because it lowered costs was the democratization of the medium, which means people who historically would not have access to the means of production now would. So that, that basically was where this philosophy of, you know, uh, access and making stuff, because I've always believed that the thing that separates, uh, well, I should say separates, the thing that makes film a, a viable, relevant art form and, and will ensure that it stays one is outside voices. If you look at the history of cinema, it's always the, the new voices that reinvigorate it bring in new things, new ways of doing things. And, and, and that's important. And what I'm gonna say is what I just did, it gave you our philosophy. I think that's important to find out from the university that you're thinking of what's their overall philosophy, what's their mission, right? My mission, you know, <laughs> is to change film for the positive, for the, for, for, for the better, right? I've always said, I can only make so many films, but as a teacher, I can influence a whole bunch of filmmakers. And so hopefully one day when I'm a lot older and grayer and I'm sitting in a rocking chair, I can turn on whatever the latest screening devices and see something that I actually enjoy watching. And hopefully it was made by one of my students from, from back in the day. So that's some of the other things to think about the overall philosophy. And the last thing, which is really important, is I tell everybody this, in the end, visit the place, get a feel for the vibe. And when you get right down to it, go with your gut. Your gut is always right. It's when you second guess yourself is it when you run into problems. And the other thing to keep in mind is uh, when it comes to picking a university, um, there's no wrong decision. People have a tendency to think I'm 18, I gotta make this, this life-changing decision. No, it's just a decision. You can always change it. There are very few um, irrevocable things, right? Don't step in front of a moving train. That's, that's a hard one to undo. But most of the things in life, you can undo. So don't get hung up on, on a, I'm going to make a mistake. You're not. As you, as you saw all of us talking about our background, it's a journey. And sometimes the more interesting the journey, the, the better the results in terms of the stuff that you're uh, making. Um, so uh, that that's kind of my take on it. Just go with your gut. <laughs> Um, I'll just add a few thoughts to those very good points. Um, in terms of production, you might want to think about what the overall arc is, right? So yes, you may want to get your hands on gear um, from day one. Where does the process lead you from there? So you might think about things like, is there a thesis project that you do before you graduate? What kind of support is provided for those projects and infrastructure, right? So we have a pretty advanced thesis process where students can get funding to make those films. They can work on a soundstage with very large and elaborate crews and set designers um, to make really high level work. And then I think asking for examples of student work is a good um, thing to look at as well. What kind of work are people making during their freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year in this program? Um, you want to think about also your runway to a job. So does a program have a semester in a lay program? If you want to be in Hollywood, I think that's really key. If you want to make that jump from a school in the Midwest to working in Los Angeles, that can be a really big leap. Um, we have a semester long program on sound stages in LA where people do internships and get a lot of industry experience. So for students who want to go that route, that's usually what they do during their last semester. And that helps them get settled in Los Angeles in a way that um, is much less daunting than starting from scratch. So that's something you might want to think about. Or um, if you're more interested in places like Atlanta or other production hubs, 
what kind of alumni does a school have working? What are, what are the graduates of a program doing? And is there an alumni community out there that you can connect with? Because that becomes really important in terms of getting work and building a professional network as well. Um, you also want to think about sort of what is the broader focus of a university, right? I think this is where Columbia is a little bit unique. We are, we are exclusively an arts and media school. So if you are really confident that this is what you want to do, that puts you in a place where you are surrounded by creative people and you can kind of feel that it's pretty palpable. It's an urban campus in an arts corridor in the South Loop and it's kind of funky and everybody is really creative and really focused on creating art and making media. Um, that can be a great thing if you're still undecided on your major and you might want to major in physics. Um, maybe that's not such a great thing, right? Um, and then within that, also thinking about what the degree programs and pathways are. Um, so for example, we have a BFA and we have a BA. So a BA is sort of general, and that's going to require fewer courses in the major and give you flexibility to experiment and try out other things. Um, a BFA is typically going to require a lot more coursework. So again, that's sort of a pathway if you really know that you want to do television. Um, putting yourself in a BA means you're going to take more classes in your major, you're going to get a deeper experience um, in Columbia, it, that also means some cohorting so you would in your initial years be in the same class with other BFA students who are very, very focused. So that might be another way for you to say build a network of people that are really committed that you can work with in school, and that you might continue working with after you graduate. Um, and then the last piece of advice I would give is to take a look at the faculty, particularly if you know what your area of focus is going to be and you know what you want to do. Take a look at who the full time faculty members are in any given program. Look for people who are doing the kind of work that you want to do and reach out to them because I think most faculty members are pretty open to talking to prospective students. And if you find somebody in your field, they're really going to be able to answer your very specific questions about what the program offers, what kinds of courses you could take, what the career pathways are in terms of internships, what your opportunities might be here in Chicago versus down the road. Um, and apart from even that process of deciding where you want to go to school, that's a great way to make a connection with a faculty member before you even land on campus so that you have that person as a you know, potential mentor for your four years that can really help guide your career. I just wanted to add one quick thing. I, I think this is all great advice and I'm sure any of us would be really happy to have you come to our university. Uh, it's important to think about sort of where the university is located as well. So if you wanna stay in Chicago, you know, we are presenting several great options for you. If you are wanting to go farther afield, that's something else to think of. I, I mentioned that my uh, journalism degree is from the University of Missouri. Now, I think uh, Missouri has uh, an amazing program in which, uh, you know, you when you're in the journalism program, you're working on the number one TV station in the market. That works because they're in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and some people like that. Some people don't want to be in a you know, town of 100,000 people. So I, I think it's important to think about for yourself, where do you want to be and how far away do you want to be from your family or how close to them? Yeah, I think those are all like very, that's all very helpful. I think that's a very great way to sort of put that. Um, so kind of leading into, um, I accidentally like typed in the chat, let's jump to misconceptions. But um, I think like something that I always kind of ran into when I was, you know, I got my film degree at DePaul and something that I was told through my social circles was sort of, I was always given these misconceptions about like, you know, majoring in art or film or media or things like that, that, you know, probably aren't always quite true. It's like, well, you can't get a job in that. How are you going to get a job in that? Or how are you going to do, like, there's, the, you don't make money in that and, and things like that. So I think like, um, you know, all these common misconceptions that I'm sure a bunch of, you know, parents have brought to you about, you know, film and TV or media, you know, things like that, you know, um, what, what do you say to those 
you know, misconceptions of like, how do you sort of like rebuttal those, you know, whether it is you can't get a job in the film, whether it is you don't make money in these fields, whether it is, it's so difficult, you're a bit, you're always a small fish in a huge pond, things like that, you know, what do you sort of to either tell parents or what do you tell students, you know, that sort of like get scared by them, that sort of like prevent them from maybe that sort of makes sense. And well, anyone can kind of jump in. I, I was going to say, I mean, I think definitely in journalism, we have in the last few years gotten those questions, but uh, I think that the job opportunities now are, are more than when I graduated from, from college because there are so many more uh, places that are doing uh, programming and, and covering news and all kinds of things. So I think in, in some ways it's, it's a great time to, to be in this field. Now that's not to say it's not competitive. Uh, you have to be good at what you do. Uh, but it goes back to what I was saying about my uh, technology class in that I feel like the more things you can do, the, the uh, better choices you have. Um, I love to tackle this one because I'm somebody who got that message going into college and was, I think, inappropriately <laughs> intimidated out of pursuing a career in journalism. Um, I absolutely agree with Lee that it is competitive, but that doesn't mean that you can't do it. And I think interestingly, what I've seen over the years is that um, I can tell by the end of a freshman year, I've been running the TV foundations program at Columbia for a long time. So I see a lot of first year students come and go. And you can really tell by the end of that first semester who's definitely gonna make it. And it's not just the people who are, I don't think it's even primarily the people who are the smartest and the most talented. It's the people who are really committed and hardworking and are just like, they're gonna make it happen. And um, about those students, I don't really have any doubts. They always end up being successful, right? So I don't think you necessarily have to be a creative genius to succeed in television. I do think, you know, if you're somebody who wants to major in TV because you like watching TV and you think it's going to be fun, well, you know, you, that you might not have the commitment to the process that it requires. But I do think that anybody who really, really wants to make a career in TV work can absolutely make that happen with a certain amount of hard work and stick to itness. Um, so I think that's an important message that if you're really committed to this and passionate about it, you can make it happen. Um, I think that also there are lots of different ways to um, pursue a career in quote unquote television, right? So some people come to the cinema and television department, they want to be the next Martin Scorsese or Wes Anderson or what have you. Um, that's a pretty challenging aspiration. Again, not to say that you can't do it, but there are so many other things that you can do. There are a million different craft careers um, that you can pursue to be part of the process that are super creative and rewarding that don't involve directing. So I think that's a misconception. A lot of people um, study film and television thinking they wanna be a director and that that's the role. Uh, but just keep in mind that there's so many other elements of the process that can be super rewarding and they have really strong career paths with lots of prospects. Um, I also think, you know, there's independent film in Hollywood, and then there's so many other ways to do production, right? There are like every corporate entity in America needs lots and lots of video work produced. And some of it is super high level and really creative. Um, branded entertainment is a new stream that we have where we've been sort of creating collaborations between television and marketing people. And that's a really sophisticated field now where you're making short films, you know, maybe they are in service of um, not necessarily even just a corporate brand, but a not for profit mission to educate and make the world a better place right that's another context in which you can be making film and television work. Um, that has a different goal and a different funding stream. Um, everything that used to be print is now video. So there are just a million different ways that you can pursue, you know, whether you could work for Peloton. Peloton. Um, you, I, and I think the, the, the notion of virtual sets is opening up a lot of opportunities as well, right? So we're starting a stream there too, in part with the idea that that's gonna open up a lot of creative avenues and a lot of new opportunities to produce stuff without some of the usual baggage and expense of locations 
um, and real world set building that's going to make more and more and more and more production happen. So um, I think the quantity and quality and diversity of jobs out there is pretty huge if you if you're open to all of the possibilities in the spectrum. One of the questions I, I get, I, and I agree with everything said, because I've gotten those 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 questions, right? You know, because when I went to, to film school back in the in the early 80s, you know, people would say, it's great you're following your passion, but you should have something to fall back on. And I tell students now the days of having something to fall back on are gone. Content is everywhere, right? And I also say, just to, to, to reinforce this, talent is important, but you do not have to be the most talented person to succeed. I, you know, I use this analogy uh, is that, you know, it, it's, it's not how you look in the first round, it's whether you're still standing in the 12th, right? It's about the perseverance, about sticking with it. And I also tell people that if you want, if you're doing this for a paycheck, there's easier ways to make money, right? Uh, I, I definitely, there's easier ways, <laughs> trust me. I used to not have gray hair. Um, and, and the other thing is, you know, um, I even say this isn't, you know, if you're going into film and television, I, I would argue it's not even a career because a career is, okay, I work to 65 or 67 now, and then I get my retirement and I go off to my lake house or whatever. Uh, it's a way of life. I mean, you've got people in their 80s making films and it's not for the paycheck. They're doing it because I don't know what else I can do. I mean, hell, I've had days where I've thought to myself, why the hell am I doing this? And then I start to think about something else to do. And then I think, what else would I do? There's nothing else <laughs> I'm qualified or desiring to do. Um, but the one other thing I want to add that hasn't been touched on is I do get the, hey, should I, get, what's, you know, should I get a BA? Should I get a BFA? You know, and I think some parents, and I'm probably of the parent generation, think, well, BFA is an art degree and it's going to be a lot harder to get a job because that's viewed as kind of an artsy fartsy degree. It's not the case. Uh, I, to be honest, at least in, in, in film and television, um, the degree doesn't matter. BA, BFA, hell, for that matter, you don't even need a degree. In this day and age, you can figure it out on your own. The reason to go to college is to broaden your horizons, expand your, 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 your knowledge base, because one of the problems I think with film uh, nowadays, especially with the studios, is they're making sequels and remakes, right? So they're already removed from reality by a couple steps, right? I think the, the best films are the films that are like one step from reality and you got to expose yourself to stuff beyond just your world. You're going to get that in college. Other thing you're going to get in college, which you can't get on your own, is you're going to get uh, collaborators. You're going to get collaborators that, that, that will stay with you after you graduate. And the other thing you're going to get is access to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars worth of equipment that you wouldn't have access elsewhere. You'd either have to rent or buy. So, you know, it, it, the thing to think about it, 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 the beauty of this field is it's not the degree, it's not the piece of paper, it's what you can do. It's your portfolio. If you can say, you show them that you can do it, you're going to get the gig and they're not going to grill you on why did you get a BFA versus a BA. And for that matter, they're not going to grill you on like, why did you go to Loyola instead of DePaul or why did you go to Columbia instead of um, uh, Loyola? They're not. You know, some people think, you know, if you get into the, the marquee, the top film schools like USC or NYU, you got it made. That's a fallacy. And it usually dooms the students because they walk in the door thinking, I made it to USC. I'm going to be a filmmaker. No, you're not. You're now just one of many <laughs> and you're still going to have to prove yourself. And whether you got that USC degree or the degree from Columbia, Chicago or uh, Loyola you, uh, or, or DePaul, you're going to still have to prove yourself which is great. You control your destiny. That's the beauty of it. You're not, don't, you have to make things happen. Don't wait for things to happen to you. This industry does not reward the timid. You have to be willing to put yourself out there and believe it or not, I'm a shy person. People will not know this when they see me in this environment. I'm naturally the kind of guy that hides in a corner at a party. Don't talk to me. I'm antisocial, but yeah, I, I was able to put myself out there. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there. If even if you're an introvert, the worst that's going to happen is somebody might say, no, not now. And you could say, well, can I follow up with you later? And a lot of times they'll say, yeah, just to get you off the phone. But you've got a door that's been left open that in three months from now, you can follow up with them and see what happens. So it, it's don't get hung up on the specifics. Guess what I'm saying? 
Yeah, and to all of this, but this has all been eloquent and great from everybody. The thing that I would also recommend to students uh, going in, yes, follow your passion. Um, Northwestern in uh, Medill, we have the Northwestern News Network. That was created by students going on 30 years ago, people like Peter Alexander at NBC, who had the passion for doing news, and they just wanted to do more. So we gave them the studio to work with. Uh, the other piece of advice I would give everybody when you go to college is find a mentor. Find somebody that, that you connect with who will be your um, guide, help you find your direction, not you know, become the individual great you that you can be. And then go forth and just go and, and go do it. And don't be afraid to uh, just keep rolling and look for schools and look for people who are going to push you in, uh, and you don't need to be pushed actually, who will guide you in the direction to help you really find your own individual voice. We just had parent-teacher conferences the other night and a lot of this is exactly what I was telling parents when they said, is my, is my child gonna be able to make a living doing something in television? And I'm like, yes. It's exactly what everyone has said. If you have the drive, if you have the desire, you will do well. You may or may not make a ton of money in your life, but that's not what it should be all about. As I tell my students, do what you love and love what you do. And if you do that, everything else in life will be wonderful. Uh, I started my first full-time job in Davenport, Iowa. I was making 14500 a year. You learn how to survive on it. Um, maybe not the best, you know, the easiest thing to do, but I was enjoying what I was doing and that's what mattered. So no matter where you go to school, whatever you do, put everything you've got into it. And if you work hard and if you've got that drive, you'll be good. And don't settle. That's the other thing, right? I mean, one through line, I think maybe of all of our like history of when we were saying how we got here, the one through line is we didn't settle. We were in something that you know, wasn't we, we wanted to try something different and, we, and we, we kept moving, right? It's the old, you know, analogy, you know, a shark, if they don't swim, they drown. Don't settle. If, if something's not working, if something feels off, keep moving, find that, find that job, find that position that that's going to, you're going to find, you know, fulfilling. And, and again, it's not about the money. As I said, you want a paycheck, there's easier jobs. Um, you know, I started, you know, working part-time right out of Northwestern. I was lucky, but I was making minimum wage at the time, which I think was 335. We're talking, you know, it's a while ago, but eventually that part-time thing became a full-time thing. And I eventually started making decent money, but it took a little bit, but you just got to keep at it. Yeah, no, this has been like incredible advice. I love the, uh, the positive energy that we're like sort of leading into. And I think a kind of a follow-up question, it might be kind of like a two-parter, um, when I was in school, I would mean, when I, when I went to college, like I was sort of grateful enough to kind of like, know, like, okay, this is what I'm going to focus in this one to do. But I also met tons of people who were like, well, I want to do film, but I have like kind of no idea what the heck to do, or they're in college still. And they're just completely undecided still. They knew that they wanted to go to college, but what they want to focus in, whether it was media, whether it was like a degree in general, they were just kind of unsure, you know, and we talked a lot about like, you know, following like your passions and stuff but like you know I've met so many people who have so many passions and interests in so many different things and like everything sort of interests them um I guess like how would you you know guide a student who's you know relatively unsure but wants to do a lot into finding the thing that really gets them going like that that passion that you speak of whether it's through like clubs and organizations at the school or whether it is taking a bunch of classes um things like that, if that sort of makes sense. I think good curriculum does that, right? Any good program, I think part of our goal really with our undergraduate degree is to help students who know they wanna work in television and they're passionate about it, get from this place of, I'm really passionate about TV, I want a career in TV. And that's just sort of a big idea to a really clear sense of what their career goals are going to be at the end of that pathway. I think this is one of those ways in which talking to a faculty member before you sign on to a school can be really helpful. So hopefully that means being able to try out a lot of different things during your first year, right? So you want a well-rounded first year experience where you can write and ideate and shoot and edit and get your hands on every aspect of the process. 
Um, and then maybe a little flexibility for the first couple of years to keep trying out different things that you're interested in and then some flexible pathways, right? So within our BA or our BFA, you can choose a, a pathway in cinematography or editing or directing, producing, production design, you know, you can pick those pathways, but you don't have to select it in the first year and you can sample before you make that decision. Um, and then I think you can also look at what happens during, this is a good question to ask admissions people and faculty members, what is happening during your junior and senior year that helps you transition into a career, right? So that might include coursework that really looks at sort of functional aspects of things that you might do as a first job out of school. Um, it might involve career preparedness courses. So we have a variety of those, like some focus on entrepreneurship. If you wanna maybe start your own production company and be a content creator. Um, you might look for courses in portfolio development or resources at the college that are gonna help you build a portfolio that gets you where you wanna be. Um, you're gonna look at internships um, because that's a great way to figure out what you do and don't wanna do is actually doing an internship at a place that you think might be um, the kind of place where you might wanna work where you can shadow people and see what that job actually looks like and learn a bit more on the job um, before you graduate. Um, again, semester in LA programs are really key there. Um, yeah, I think all of those things are really what gets you from that first year experience to knowing what you wanna do when you graduate. And it's okay if you graduate and you don't have a crystal clear idea either. If you've narrowed down the focus to a variety of options, um, that's a good place to start. I didn't, I don't, I don't think anybody on the panel here knew exactly what we wanted to do when we finished college. We had a general idea and we continued to refine and tweak that as, you know, and there are going to be jobs out there that don't even exist yet that you might be doing five or 10 years from now. So um, I wouldn't panic too much about having like an explicit career trajectory on day one or even necessarily the day you graduate. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think, you know, I understand the focus on employment, right? Because college is not cheap. I mean, even state schools, relatively speaking, are still expensive, right? Um, I don't remember what I paid when I went to Northwestern, but it was significantly less than what students are, are paying now. And then the same is across the board with all, all universities. Um, but I think you shouldn't, you know, yes, employment is important, but at the same time, you know, what's the point of college is to broaden your horizons, help you develop ways to think, you know, I mean, you could say part of the problems, I'm getting a little political now with the, the state of the world right now, is you have people who are not knowledgeable about a lot of things that they used to be, right? So broaden your horizons. And just like uh, in Columbia, uh, we've got a BA and a BFA, and I somebody in the, in the um, chat said, what's the difference? And it's the same as Columbia, is that there are more courses within the major in the BFA and more kind of liberal arts gen ed courses in the BA. But the, the thing to, to, to keep in mind is dabble, take some chances, take some courses you took for the hell of it. When I was at Northwestern, even though I was a radio TV film major, I took political science classes. I like political science and I took a bunch of them just for the heck of it. it was, I had a good time, it was, it was great. Um, the other one is, um, in, just like Columbia in our case, the first year, the BA and the BFA, the courses are the same. Because I don't expect a student at, at 18 to know their, their life path. It's like, you, you can come in as a BA and then switch to the BFA. You can come in one area in the BFA and switch to the, another area in the BFA in that first year, no issue, even in the second year without a, without a problem. And the other thing I always tell prospective students, especially as they're getting ready to graduate, right? One thing we've done at DePaul is, and, I, and other, the other programs are doing the same. I'm not saying we're separate than this, is when, at least when I went to school, um, they really focused on the art and the craft, but not what you do post-graduation. It was like you graduate and there was a handshake, good luck, right? <laughs> and it's like, oh, what am I supposed to do now, right? So we've, we've even tried to incorporate that so students have a game plan before they get out the door of what they're supposed to do. But even that, I say, the, the problem you've got as high school students is you've been on a schedule your whole life right? Elementary school for five or six years, depending on the, the setup of your, your system, you know, middle school or junior high for two or three years, four years of high school, four years of college. So there's this like end and we move on. There's this transition. You graduate, it's the rest of your life. And people have different paths and different timelines. So I always tell students, if by the end of your 20s, you know what you want to do, you're ahead of the game. If by the end of your 30s, you're doing it, you're ahead of the game. If by the end of the 40s, you're having some success at it, 
you're ahead of the game. So it's a process. It's not like I got to be done in, in, in a year or 10 weeks or 16 weeks like you're used to with courses. It's, it's your path and you will get there. I have a couple of thoughts. One is I definitely agree with the notion, do some sampling, see what you like, because part of knowing what you want is knowing what you don't want. And there are things maybe that you don't like. And the other thing, uh, speaking from a uh, person who, who had a great career as a TV producer, when I first went to journalism school, I didn't know what a TV producer did. You don't really see what TV producers do or, uh, you know, you see the anchor. And so you come in and say, oh, I want to anchor. But, uh, and same thing in film, there are, there are plenty of jobs that when you start out, you may not even know about those jobs. So find out what else is out there, not just the things that, uh, that you grew up uh, watching and, and maybe aspiring to. Yeah, I think that's like, oh, sorry, go oh. ahead. I was gonna say no. These are these are all great points because I even remember when I was touring DePaul, uh, I was I stepped into like an animation uh, thing and I was like, oh my god, this is like not me at all. And then when I actually met DePaul, I took a few animation classes and I'm like, this is amazing. And then I ended up almost getting a minor in 3D animation. So I I just recommend students to just try things that even you might even think that oh I'm not gonna like this. You never know until you try. And it's it's an awesome experiment experience. And college is the perfect place to just kind of delve into whatever you can and uh, see what sticks. Um, and I think that also applies to classes outside of journalism or outside of broadcasting. I advise in both Medill and the Department of po Political Science. And when I'm advising all of my students, I say, when you're choosing your GE courses, take a look at the ones that are going to count toward graduation. We get, go outside your comfort zone. Go way outside your comfort zone. Take some classes that, that looks interesting. Well take it. And it may open a whole new creative door for you within journalism or within TV production or within documentaries. It may, that can open a, a whole new door for you too. Exactly. And then moving on to our last section about involvement in resources, um, can each of the panelists kind of give a little brief overview of what kind of clubs or organizations are offered by your college and university, like ways to get involved on campus that's not just through class or like study abroad opportunities that are available at your universities? Uh, I'll go first, I guess. Um, study abroad is available at Northwestern University. Uh, we have a number of students who um, uh, go to uh, Seance Po in, in Paris is one of the first places that I think of in terms of study abroad um, in internships that, that we have. But in terms of clubs, Northwestern has uh, the Northwestern News Network, which is something that, as I mentioned earlier, it's still student uh, run. I've been the advisor of it since 2007. I think I'm like their third or fourth advisor, but it's students run. It's a passion work by the student. And this goes to what we've all been talking about in terms of uh, follow your passion. I just want to play the open of a recent internet <coughs> newscast for, there it is. Coming up on the Northwestern News Report, a look at COVID-19 in Evanston and on campus. Is Northwestern's testing policy enough? Plus, staff shortages affecting schools nationwide. What does that look like in Evanston? And are the takeout containers going missing from the dining halls? We took a look at the new program to prevent the disappearances. Those stories and more tonight on the Northwestern News Report. It's your news right now. So, so that's just a brief introduction. We have a great studio. Uh, I have a lot of students who think they uh, live in the studio. Uh, but, but, but they do, but it's a very successful program. It's a passion uh, project for them. Uh, they've won, well, since I've, since I've been there, 
uh, and I had nothing to do with this. It's all them except to try to point them in the right direction. They've won three national college Emmys and about a dozen um, Chicago Midwest Crystal Pillars uh, for Best Newscast, along with a lot of other individual reports. And the students can do that just like they can do the Daily Northwestern, our newspaper, North by Northwestern, Inside Northwestern, which is support uh, sports. Uh, they can do that for their entire time at Northwestern. So there's a lot of activities and it's a place where they can grow and uh, meet lifelong friends and connections. Yeah, to Paul, um, on, on the journalism side uh, or the, the broadcasting side, I mentioned we have a radio station um, uh, as well as uh, there's a, a, a newscast or magazine show that the, the broadcast journalism do, students do, Good Day to Paul. Um, in terms of on, on the film and TV side in the School of Cinematic Arts, the, the one organization that I always say students should join is the DePaul Cinema Collaborative. It was actually a, an organization that was started by students who were just kind of more committed to the program like over 10 years ago. They wanted to just have more involvement and maybe some kind of say in the, the, the direction the program took. And that, pro, that, that, uh, uh, that group is probably, I think is the largest student group, at least active student group on campus. And that's one that's really good to get a hold, to be a member of because in the quarterly meetings, you get updates on what's going on at the school, new opportunities but it's also a chance to network with students, pitch projects, you know, find crew and all that. So that's the one that I always recommend students get involved in. Uh, we have some offshoots of the DCC, uh, film fatales, inclusion in the industry, which are again, uh, opportunities to get involved. We have a cinematography club, a documentary club. So there's a lot of smaller groups depending on your area of interest. In terms of study abroad, I already put it in the chat that we've got um, uh, an LA program like Columbia. Uh, I think we're actually neighbors now uh, on Sunset Las Palmas. But anyways, it was a little Chicago enclave. Um, but uh, so we've got an LA quarter program, but which we view as kind of a domestic study abroad. But in terms of uh, other true study abroad programs, we have a, um, a film in Paris program where students go to Paris for uh, a quarter, take classes, intern at the Champs-Élysées Film Festival, and then do kind of a field trip for the lack of uh, a better way of putting it to the Cannes Film Festival, because it's in, in spring quarter for us. So it, it lines up with Cannes. Uh, we also have a Bollywood and Beyond uh, study abroad where students go to India and get exposed to the Indian film industry. But while they're out there, they also make short documentaries for nonprofits in, in India. And then uh, another one that uh, just started uh, this year is uh, uh, film in Berlin. Uh, it's a shorter term study abroad. Students take a class kind of prepping them for it. And then uh, around spring break, they go to, uh, to Berlin for uh, 10 days. Um, we also have uh, a, a study abroad on the animation side that goes to the Ottawa Animation Festival. There's another one that's kind of tied to the game program that goes to Tokyo. Uh, and then uh, DePaul has just the general study abroad programs that you know most university have, or if you want to go study in England, study in in France or whatever, you can do that. And we work about you know transferring the courses back. So there are opportunities. And I always tell students too. And again, this is just my little thing: is you know, film has always been an international art form, right? But we have a tendency to be so Hollywood centric that we forget about the rest of the world. You can't forget about the rest of the world, especially in this day and age where things are becoming more and more global uh, from a, from a storytelling standpoint, but even from a business standpoint, you know, the, the co-productions, the financing, it's all, it's all international now. It's not just, you know, the big studios. And I put uh, some of the Loyola's opportunities in the chat. Uh, students really can get involved in a number of different activities from their very first day on campus. Um, one that students are most passionate about is called the Rambler Sports Locker, which is, uh, as you might imagine, very sports focused. Uh, those students are in St. Louis today covering uh, the Ramblers in the Arch Madness Tournament. And in 2018, when we went to the Final Four, uh, the school paid for students to go to each round of the tournament. So uh, 
there definitely are a number of different clubs that the students who who work with them are very passionate and it's a way as we were talking before to to get your hands on the equipment to get some experience and to uh really learn a lot and uh figure out what you really like to do I also added a bunch of links to the chat with student organizations and study abroad. Um, I don't know how much I need to elaborate on this here. I would say, you know, things to think about are you definitely want a school that has a multimedia newspaper, right? So the Columbia Chronicle does print journalism, but also video. We have a TV station, Frequency TV, that's totally student run and has won student Emmys and that sort of thing. Um, there are lots of study abroad programs. The one I'm most familiar with is a summer program in Germany where students make documentaries because that's my area, but there are lots of different study abroad programs and also some flexibility. I don't know if this is true of other programs or not, but if you wanna design your own study abroad program, there are ways to do that. The college helps provide you a list of partners. And so um, you can DIY your way to that if there's something in particular that you wanna do in terms of study abroad. Awesome. I mean, yeah, all, I've been looking at the chat and the resources and everything that's coming in and it's, it's just so incredibly helpful. And I think, you know, I think this might be one of like the last questions that Laura and I have until we get into the Q&A section. Um, and, you know, a lot of amazing, helpful information for like, you know, a lot of like high school students to like, you know, take with them. And I think, you know, maybe to sort of maybe dial or realign it in some way is you know, what are some ways that high school students can get involved in the career? How can they get involved now in the careers that they want to do? What are some things that jun the juniors and seniors or maybe even like the sophomores and freshmen, what, what can they do now, whether it's at their high school, whether it's outside of their high school to get involved a lot more in like what they wanna do? I'm just gonna speak to the to the film, the people that are interested in film, because that's it, my, strength, even though I have worked in, in, in broadcasting and, and other stuff over the years. Um, but to be honest, and this is what I tell everybody, undergrads, prospective grad students, watch movies, watch television, but watch stuff that was not part of your normal viewing, right? Go to, you know, if you, if you hate films with subtitles, go watch a film with subtitles. If you hate animation, go watch an animated film. You're right. That's what you want to do. You want to expose yourself to, to what's out there. You, you, you cannot expect to be um, making content if you don't know the canon of what came before. You know, it's the old saying we're on the, on the shoulders of giants. I mean, it's, it's a continuum from, from the early days to today. So you, you got to really expose yourself to that. Read books, interviews with filmmakers, just expose yourself to that. I think that's really, it's something that you can completely control. If you got ideas, Get a notebook, write down ideas for movies, right? Even if you're not a writer, you got an idea. You can go find a writer to help work on the idea, but just, just keep, you know, I always say this, and I find myself doing this, right? I'll be in my office and I start watching a movie and I think to myself, get back to work, stop, stop wasting time. And then I realize, wait, it's what I do. This is research. This is actually my job, <laughs> watching this stuff and analyzing it. And I think you should start to view it as this kind of feeding the muse stuff as part of the process. It's not you screwing around being unproductive. It's part of what it is to be a content creator. You, you have to educate yourself on, on, on what's out there. And I, that's what I would focus on because uh, it, 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 it's something you can completely control. There's other things you can do too, but I'll leave that to, to some other people to, to chime in on. Yeah, I think for some people, if you have a lot of production opportunities in your high school, there are obvious ways to get involved. But if you don't go to a high school that has a lot of curriculum in this area or a lot of gear, there is so much you can learn online. And I am amazed um, these days at how much my incoming freshmen know because they've taught themselves using online resources. Um, the guide that the junior board put together has a lot of good resources, some of which we helped crowdsource. Um, but there are just amazing things that you can teach yourself if you are so motivated. And I think learning how to do that from a young age is an incredible skill. 
Right. So I think we live at a time where there are lots of great reasons to get a college degree, right? It gives you a curriculum, a pathway, a set of relationships, a network, a mentor, all of these really important things. But the basic tools of learning are already at your disposal. So, you know, if you are interested in sort of the creative aspects of filmmaking, you can look at things like um, I like Studio Binder a lot. They're just really great resources that will help you understand things like um, why do you love Wes Anderson movies, right? You love Wes Anderson, why? How can you pick apart what Wes Anderson does with color and with world building and with editing and with shot choices and really understand the language of cinema through Wes Anderson, whatever it is that you're passionate about, whether it's something technical like cinematography or learning how to use After Effects um, or something more creative and conceptual, start teaching yourself some of those things and digging in where you can. And you're, you're gonna, it's gonna help you find that focus and passion that you have within the broader world of TV and film. Um, it'll give you a leg up in terms of you're gonna enter college knowing some things you wouldn't otherwise. But most importantly, I think it's just, there really are almost two kinds of students today, right? There are the students who walk into the classroom and are sort of like a vessel waiting for you to fill them with knowledge. And then there are students who recognize, okay, I'm gonna get something out of this class this is gonna provide me a framework. But if I wanna know more, I'm just gonna go out and find that information wherever I need to find it. Um, and it's the students in that latter category who are gonna learn exponentially faster and be really well set up for life because once college is over, you don't stop learning. You wanna be one of those people who can keep teaching themselves new and different things as the field evolves. Yes, and as to add on to both of those great thoughts, um, you have the you have the resources if you have a cell phone and some basic editing equipment. So go ahead right now and start shooting stuff. Start putting stuff together. Maybe create your own YouTube channel. Uh, I remember Omar Jimenez, who is now at CNN. Um, just before school started, my office door was in. He walked in, knocked on the door, walked in, says, "Hi, I'm Omar." Would you look at a documentary I shot in high school? And so now he's at CNN and that was the kind of passion that he had. But yes, that is all of this advice that, that you just heard is spot on. Go forth now. You don't have to wait for college. Here in the Chicago area, uh, we're very fortunate. We have an organization called the Midwest Media Educators Association. Um, used to be called CTEC and uh, Chicago and Television Educators Council until we expanded beyond the Chicago area. So we have a school in uh, southeastern Wisconsin, northwestern Indiana. We go out as far almost to the Quad Cities to Geneseo with members. We've got about 45 member schools from this area that are involved with this. And this is high school teachers that have this organization. And we meet at least twice a year. We have video competitions. This is the kind of stuff we talk about. So hearing about all these local schools is gonna be so helpful for us to be able to pass this along to our members. But if you're a high school student out there, if your school happens to be a member, reach out to the teacher at your school who teaches media, television, newspaper, get involved. If you can't fit the class in your schedule, talk with them about, is there a club? Is there an after school activity that you can get involved with? Have them, like Larry was saying, create stuff and have them look at what you're creating and to give you feedback. <clears throat> if your school is not a member of our organization, by the way, I I'll put the website in the chat, but if you're not a member, <clears throat> excuse me, and you've got these programs at your school, reach out to us, become a member. Um, and everybody, you're welcome to even reach out to me and I'll give you feedback. I'll let you know if your school is part of the organization. If they're not, I'll contact them and get them to be part of uh, our group, because it really is, it's a great organization where we help uh, other high schools, school, uh, other high schools, as well as students to get into this industry, whether it is journalism, production, film, whatever. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think those are all amazing points that will definitely help students kind of navigate what, what there is to do now and how to kind of jumpstart their, their passions. Um, but I think that wraps up our third section. So now we are going on to the Q and A. I see quite a few questions coming in. Um, and if students that are on the call, if you have more questions, please pop them in and we'll try to answer as many as we can before we wrap up for the day. Um, 
I saw Lee, you answered one student's question, but we can kind of go back to this and get everyone's uh, point of view. We have an anonymous attendee who said, if I am 99% sure that I want to go into the more creative production aspect of media rather than broadcasting and journalism, do you still recommend me taking a couple of communications related courses in college? Are there benefits to doing this that employers or professors might look at? Actually, so one thing I wanna to add to that is uh, broadcast and journalism, I wouldn't call non-creative. Uh, I think you can be very, very creative in journalism. You don't have to just cover, you know, the the city council meeting. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, yeah, I I had answered that in the chat, but maybe other panelists will have thoughts about it too. I think part of it goes back to points that Gary and Kristen were making about, okay, BA versus BFA. Once you get into a professional context, I don't think the employers are really going to know uh, whether or not you took COM 101. Uh, it might be something you take toward getting your degree, but uh, it really to me, it matters what you can do and, and uh, what you can show a potential employer. Yes, agreed. It's, you know, what can you do? They want to see what, what you have produced. They want to see the video. They want to see the creative product that you have put together yourself. Um, so, and I've had journalism students who have gone out 10, 15 years, and journalism is demanding. Uh, if you're doing TV news, if you're doing online news, I don't care where you're working. There's a lot of hours and a lot of work. And some people, they, they to be honest with you, they, they burn out on it or they want to do something else. I have a former uh, master's degree student who um, she was doing uh, producing daily news. And now she is producing, she's a field producer for one of those home repair uh, TV shows. But that's being creative. That's putting the show together. And she loves what she does. And now she has more time for her two kids. So there's lots of ways that you can um, you can take what you learn. You learn critical thinking when you're doing any aspect of journalism. You learn how to present uh, arguments and ideas and or thoughts. And those are all skills that are easily easily translatable to a whole host of fields. So yeah, there's lots of things that you can do. Awesome, and then looking at other Q&A stuff that we have, I saw a lot of you already popped links in chat. Uh, another student asked, are scholarships available at these schools? Which, do you wanna kind of talk through what you guys, uh, links and stuff that you gave? Well, in, in the case of DePaul, I put it in there is that, you know, DePaul has scholarships um, and uh, also provides financial aid for most of the undergraduates. Most, most undergraduates at DePaul do not pay list price, what's quoted on the, on the website. And that's the case of, at most universities. It's a, it's a secret that, that, that students don't know. It's almost like buying a car, right? You got the list price and then you got the, the price after the financial aid and scholarship. So don't let a high uh, sticker uh, price uh, deter you. Have conversations with with the the school, and and um, the, there's a very good chance that you're not going to be paying as much as you think you're going to be paying. Um, the other one is uh, in terms of uh, the uh, oh the, uh, the there's also scholarships outside of of the school that you should think about because there's this thing called scholarship connect which is, is a way to find out what scholarships are out there and you could be of a, of a certain demographic that qualifies you for a scholarship that others don't which actually increases your odds of getting it i know there's one by like united airlines if you're united employee of united airlines you can apply for you know a scholarship for your for your um for your dependents so see, do some research as well see what's out there because there, there is money out there that people may not be aware of yeah as was mentioned at the beginning of the program too natus has three scholarships the local chicago chapter um so and the deadline for that is march 18th uh so you know you can apply for those medill 
uh, offers very few scholarships. Uh, that is something that our current dean is working very hard to remedy. And, uh, but there is work study. And so, uh, and some of that work study can be applied to working on productions within uh, Medill. And the, uh, but what Gary was saying about look around for outside scholarships that, that really applies there. Another opportunity is looking at your local community colleges. Uh, someone put it in the chat. We have a partnership with the College of DuPage, and I know our first two media classes here at Nequa Valley, they are dual credit, which means students, when they take those first two years with us, they are earning six credit hours of college credit at absolutely no cost to them. They'll receive a transcript from COD. How that transfers will depend on the school that they end up going to, whether it's general elective credit or credit in their area, in their major. But that's another opportunity is local community colleges because you can do your general education classes and maybe even take some classes in a major or dabble in something you might be interested in to find your niche and then you can move on from there. Yeah, I just, uh, I, I actually used to teach at COD, uh, College of DuPage for a few years. And, and actually somebody else who's now at DePaul we actually was running the program there for a bit. Um, but it just, a promo for COD, College of the Page is a great program in, 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 in media. So if you are looking to kind of, um, you know, reduce cost and, and, and it's junior college, especially if you're living in the district that College of the Page is in, would be something I'd seriously look at. I would agree with that. And I also put in the chat that Loyola has a community college affiliate called Arupe College. And uh, they have programs as well that, that would lead you to an associate's degree, or you could then go on to apply at Loyola or at other schools. Yeah, that's great. I have several friends who went to, to ECC uh, before transferring them to their four-year college, which is, or two-year then, which is a, Great, great plan for saving money and um, learning more stuff and getting introduced to more people and networking even more. Um, we have another question in chat uh, from Sarah. She's asking, are there schools in other countries that have similar programs to the types of programs that we are talking? Do you, are any of our colleges, universities here partnered with any abroad universities for anything or how do we, do you guys know of any? <laughs> well, there are, Go ahead, oh, I, I was real quick. We, we've actually started a few years ago this thing at the Paul called um, Global Learning Exchange, which is a uh, it's basically a virtual study abroad. And the way it works is a class at the Paul is partnered with a class at a university in another country. Uh, and we've done it with universities in Scotland, Australia, uh, uh, Croatia. So we've got these kind of partnerships. So there are other film programs out there. If you're thinking of going internationally to, to, to school, some of the things you wanna think about are probably the obvious ones, right? What is the language of instruction? Because some schools will speak, would, would teach in English, others you gotta learn um, the language. I know Woch, which is probably one of the best known film schools in Poland. Uh, I think you actually have to take Polish language classes before and, and get some proficiency in Polish before you can actually start taking the film classes. So there are programs out there. Um, if you want to find out about the international programs, actually what you could really do is just Google top international film schools and you'll get, we, we are the Yelp generation. So you always get rankings out there. So you'll see what, what's out there, but there are opportunities. My, my take, this is just me. If, if you're going to think about studying abroad, like getting a degree from another university uh, internationally, I'd probably think about that for graduate school as opposed to undergrad. I think, that, I think that's an easier thing to do. Um, and it, it's uh, prepare yourself here and then move abroad. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, at at Medill, we, uh, you can arrange for journalism residency. We've had students in the past in, Medill will collaborate with you. Uh, I know we've had students in the past who have done internships at uh, or spent a quarter with uh, the BBC. Um, but mostly what we offer at Northwestern University and Medill is study abroad, but that is taking courses to fulfill your general education requirements. Cool. 
Cool. And then we have one more question. Um, do most schools require uh, that students submit a portfolio of work as part of their college application? We do not at Loyola. It's, it's not part of the application process. In the case of DePaul, the film and television program doesn't have a portfolio requirement. The animation program does, even though we are having some conversations in the film and TV side about uh, putting a portfolio requirement in. But as of now, there's no portfolio requirement. I believe it's optional across the degrees at Columbia. Um, what you might be required to do is at least write a creative essay about the kinds of work you want to make, your motivations, what aspects of film and television you're interested in. Um, and then I think an actual work sample, be it a screenplay or a production, is optional, but certainly helpful. And I typed this in the chat earlier. Um, there are scholarships, for example, I just finished reviewing 150 scholarship applications from freshman students for um, scholarships that we offer going into the fall of your sophomore year. The portfolio pieces are pieces that these students generated in high school that were part of their application process. So having something, um, even if it's a screenplay, can be really helpful to you going into this process for sure. And I've, I've had students, we, we, in case of DePaul, it's optional. People have submitted portfolios on the film and TV side. And I'll just give you, if you're going to a school that has a portfolio requirement, my advice would be really focus on that personal statement, the, the creative statement, because that's what really people are going to uh, look at, because what we're looking for is potential. If you're an expert filmmaker, there's no need to go to college, right? So we don't expect your stuff to be fantastic. It's great if it is, but we don't expect that. It's really more about potential. And I think if you have a portfolio piece, it's basically saying you've gone that extra mile. You know, it's almost like an extracurricular thing. You've gone above and beyond to create stuff and, 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 and do that while you're in high school. And that is, is you know, worth noting, but it's really more about, I think in my mind, that creative statement. So focus really on that. Do not write a five paragraph essay of why you wanna to go to Columbia or Loyola or, or DePaul. Really give us kind of like a glimpse of who you are as a person, your experiences and the kind of stuff you wanna make. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think the personal statement is really, really important. Um, at Northwestern, we at Northwestern actually Medill, we don't have a say in who we admit to the, our journalism program. That is decided by the admissions um, department of uh, Northwestern University. Uh, but it is important when they look at the, the applications that they see that they have a background in news. Right now in uh, high school and junior high schools, we have the Medill Cherubs program, which is a summer program where students come in and it's really, uh, you can have two or three years of, of a boot camp, journal, boot camp journalism experience there. And that counts a lot toward the admission to uh, Northwestern and Medill. But uh, the personal statement is important. Uh, let your passion come through for journalism. If you have some background experience that you already have, uh, make sure you highlight that. Uh, and uh, then it just goes to them and then it comes to us. On the graduate school, we choose all of our graduate students. And if you're looking for sites that you can use to create this portfolio, our students will primarily use Weebly, W-E-E-B-L-Y.com. It's a free site. Google Sites is also another place, but it allows you to upload written work, video work. You can write statements, put pictures. So definitely look into creating that online presence. Those are all great points. We had um, some students actually submit questions before this event started. Uh, one of them was, what would you tell students who currently don't have the inner confidence right now that they can make it in this field? It ain't rocket science. If it was rocket science, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I wouldn't be doing it, right? I am not the most talented person. It, it, it's, it's really about passion and, and perseverance in, in the end. Um, I've never had to put on a suit and work a nine to five job, you right? I, I have avoided that. Now that this, some people might like that, but you know, my, this, is, this is my standard apparel. And I think, uh, Lauren and Ronan would know that this is pretty much my standard apparel, right? It, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's, 
it's not as hard as you think it is. And I think it goes back to even what I touched on when I was talking about portfolios. We have a tendency to be very self-critical and we think our stuff isn't as good as it, as it needs to be. And the reality, it, it is. I mean, the odds are your stuff is as good as where it needs to be where you're at now. The whole point of going to college is to get better at it. And in post-college is to keep working and getting better at it. I think the bo best you can hope for in, 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 in film, and I think it applies to all areas, is that your next project is better than your last. That's really it. Yeah, so you're making progress, right? Don't think about awards. Don't think about you know, you know, Academy Awards, Emmys. As long as the stuff is getting better, you're making progress. If you're familiar with Ira Glass, the creator of This American Life, there's a great quote that he said some years ago that I like to share with my first year students. I can only paraphrase it, but basically the idea is that you get into media because you have really good taste, right? People who want to study film and television often have great taste in television and films and they know a great movie when they see one. But in the beginning, you can't achieve that yourself, right? So you go through many, many years of frustration because you know what a great movie looks like, but you don't know how to make one. Um, and he claims that it took him longer than anybody he knows to master that process. And he really is the master of the process. Right. So I think where you're at right now, it's appropriate to be in that stage of I have good taste and I can't make the things that I know are great. And that makes me feel a little bit insecure. Um, but insecurity is the driver of learning and the driver of creativity and every good director out there goes through a moment of panic with every film and television show they make that maybe it's not going to be great and awesome. Right. So all of those feelings, I think, are really natural and um, sort of part of where you're at in the process. So I just encourage you to keep trying and learning um, and get as much experience as possible to give yourself a sense of whether you are in a space that feels appropriate, whether you like the process, whether you wanna keep learning and going and not feel like you need to have an answer to that question or be able to make the media, media that's as great as the stuff that you love right now. Yeah, actually, I show that Ira Glass. I found a grainy <laughs> video of it on YouTube that I, that I show usually my like first year students to, and even students who is about to graduate to kind of reinvigorate them. And one of the things he says, and you, you did a great job of, 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 of quoting, paraphrasing. One of the things he says, though, too, is do not give up because you have this idea of this is what I'm supposed to be doing and this is what I'm doing. And the key is do not give up. You just got to stick it with it and get there. And, and what he recommends doing is make stuff, put yourself on deadlines. It's better if you've got somebody you can hand it to that's waiting for something, but even if it's not that, you wanna be making stuff because every time you make something, you're getting better at it. It's weird, I, and I don't know why this is the case, maybe because media is so instantaneous, we just turn it on and watch it. People feel like they should be masters of it from the get-go. At the same time, if, if, if uh, I asked you to sit down at a piano and you weren't a piano player, you never took a piano a lesson, and I asked, told you to play a song, and you're like, I don't know how to play the piano, I'd be the one that was crazy if I was berating you to play the piano, right? Because you don't know what you're doing. The same thing applies to, to film, but for some reason, we have this perception that, oh, yeah, because it's, it's instantaneous, we turn it on and we watch it, it should be easy to make. It's one of the hardest things to make. And that, and that goes for, for journalism as well. I mean, if you think about that in journalism, you're taking a, a, a story and you're trying to distill it to, to its essence so people can get it in, 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 a, in a succinct manner. It's, it's not easy. It's, it's something you continually have to work at. And that's okay. That's the process. I like oh, sorry, Larry, go ahead. No, Lee, go ahead. So I was just going to say an, another great thing I think about uh, these fields is that whether you are an extrovert or an introvert, there are things that you can do because there are so many different aspects that go into it. So uh, don't feel like you have to be the most outgoing person in the room to succeed in film or television, because as, as we've been saying, there are so many different jobs that really take a, a lot of different skills. What I like to tell, I like to quote a jazz trumpeter by the name of Clark Terry in terms of the learning process and having a passion for what you're doing and realizing it's a growth process. Uh, he did a, a seminar that I watched online on improvisation one time. And his advice was, um, first you imitate, 
then you assimilate, and then you innovate. So my first exposure to what I knew I really wanted to do TV news was the CBS Evening News as a kid with Walter Cronkite, watching those reports. Then I got in the business and I started doing it myself. I started shooting it. I learned from doing that. And then I watched other people and I assimilated some of what they did and then incorporated that into my work. And then the further I got in the business, particularly when I was uh, working in New York and New Jersey, then I was working with other people, collaborating and innovating. So don't think you have to be the top right now, but you'll get there and just keep confidence in yourself. Imitate, assimilate, innovate. And I just wanted to piggyback on what, what Lee said. You know, some people might think to get into this field, you have to be an extrovert. You have to be, you know, a glad hander, great in social settings. S some areas in this field, yes. If you're a producer, that's advantageous, right? Um, director, you have to be able to, to work, you know, con control or, or, or lead a crew. But if you're an introvert, I, this doesn't apply to Lauren because I know Lauren, but a lot of the people in post are introverts. There's, there's an instructor at the Paul Savas Peritzis, and, and Savas always is like, the world is ending and he's quiet. And it, but it, so it, there's always, there, you're going to gravitate. If you're a loner, it's screenwriting, it's post. If you're a people person, it's, um, it's uh, producing. If you like making things with your hands, you've got production design. There, there's a lot of opportunities that, that you can find that will, 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 will sync up with who you are as a person. And you don't have to reinvent yourself uh, to be what you want to be. I also say too, just as like maybe something to toss in there. The, the from like a, a film background too. The you know the couple of film sets that I've been on and like the production office that I work in. I'm surrounded by introverts. Like I was interviewed by three people who are introverted people. So like it's it's very common. Like there's very few people that I've met that are like those super outgoing like LA style hustlers. You know that I've met very few of them. And the amount of people that I've met here. You know, just working on like a couple of sets, it's like a very small career kind of going on. But you'll find a lot of people that aren't, you know, super outgoing. You there are, but there's a lot that you'll see that are very introverted. Like there's someone in the office I've been working at for like the last like six months, and we've just avoided introducing each other because we're just like scared to like socially, you know, confront and like say, oh hi, you know what I mean? But it's it's totally normal. You see tons of people like that, and it breaks the ice because then it like reassures you like oh okay well there's introverted people here too that means that i'm not somebody who likes to be the center of attention so they're here and they're doing a cool job so that's kind of like reassuring to see that there's people like you like that you know they're in those fields yeah well, i want to say this too filmmakers are nerds we are we just put pick, pick the field that people think is cool we're just as obsessed and, and focused on something as maybe a a, a computer scientist might be in some other fields, but we're just nerds in a cool field. We were obsessed about this. I remember seeing an interview with Martin Scorsese and the interviewer asked him at some point, um, you know, uh, Marty, do you think you have Asperger's? Back in the day when they actually classified it as Asperger's, that's changed since. But anyway, do you think you have Asperger's? And he paused for a second and thought, yeah, maybe I do. Because if you ever seen an interview with, with Martin Scorsese, he just goes on and on and on about film. He's like an expert backwards and forwards on it. It's just, he's, he's, he's a nerd, but he picked a cool area. Steven Spielberg is a nerd. They just picked cool areas to, to focus on. But yeah, don't be a, you know, you don't have to be somebody who's gonna, gonna be the center of attention. Awesome. Yeah, I see. Um, also in chat, Ronan, when you were talking about what you do, uh, we, we are asking ourselves, what do we do now? And what was our journey to get there? So do you want to kind of talk about what, what you're doing? Uh, I work for the NBC show Chicago Fire um, in the production office. So I'm, I'm just an office PA. And uh, it's like, you know, entry level there. Before that, I was sort of, well, I graduated in June from DePaul's in film. And so I uh, kind of went straight into trying to get on set as a PA. Didn't, you know, didn't really plan to end up in the office per se. I just kind of kept, okay, well, I was able to get on this tiny commercial and then I got on this slightly bigger commercial and then 
I got on uh, Power and then I got on like another show. And so I was just kind of like bouncing around doing stuff and then sending my resume out everywhere. And then eventually someone on fire saw it and then that's how I got that job. Um, yeah, it's fun. I don't know. Make coffee, order lunches, do cool errands every now and again. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I also attended DePaul. I majored in uh, post-production editing and then also with a minor in visual effects in 3D animation. Um, and right out of college, I got hired at Weigel Broadcasting as a media coordinator and assistant editor. I had also uh, interned there during my time at DePaul. I was their like, post-production intern. Uh, so they knew me and they had a position that was entry level and I was working there for a few months um, assisting on editing shows because they have three different networks. So I kind of managed all the media for the networks and helped assist editing, like prepping, uh, you know, projects and stuff like that for the lead editors. And then um, at the end of January, I actually just switched, um, thanks to a recommendation from a professor at DePaul, I am now working at Carbon in Chicago, which is a visual effects house for commercials. And I am currently a flame assistant, which means I'm a, like a visual effects artist assistant. So I help uh, composite shots and get stuff ready for the artist. Um, and it's really awesome. And it's kind of like a whole career shift considering I majored in editing, but now I'm a visual effects artist, but it was another passion of mine and I'm just kind of really happy uh, where I'm at. So you never know where it's going to go. Like like all of our panelists here, it's it's convoluted. And you know, if you know people that are in industries, they can help you out and get, you, get your foot in the door and somewhere else. And it's just kind of this crazy path of creativity and fun and you'll end up somewhere. <laughs> But yeah, so there's no, no no clear path for anybody. But um, I think that kind of wraps up the ending of our Q and A. Uh, panelists, do you have any other last words that you want to give students? Any like websites that you want to like that you give students that are interested in what you do, or any resources or anything that you want to kind of last last shout out? I just put my email in in the chat. So if anybody has DePaul. Uh, specific questions feel free to to reach out to me i you know i like to talk uh even though i'm an introvert so if you want to set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me just just reach out we use solo parents involved for the conversation be happy to talk yeah ditto i put the medill uh page in the chat also and my email is on there happy to talk if you're in the area uh, when NNN is producing its shows during the quarter, if you want to come by and watch one of their productions, we welcome everybody to come in and watch how the, it's, as I said before, it's a student production. They do amazing stuff, and you're welcome to come in and uh, watch and meet the students. I'm at the high school level, so if anybody doesn't have a program at their school and wants feedback, wants somebody just to reach out to, to chat, Definitely don't hesitate to reach out to me here at Niqua Valley. I've put my email in the chat. I put my email there and, and please feel free to uh, come visit us at Loyola or, or reach out by email and uh, just ask any questions you wanna ask. And, and uh, you know, based on what Ronan and Lauren were saying, I would say just, you know, be flexible be open to new opportunities. And uh, there's a wide world out there with so many different things that, that you could be doing. So keep your options open. I would say this is definitely the time of year when students come to visit campus. And if you haven't already made plans to do that, I really recommend it. You might be amazed at how much contact you can get with faculty, with students. I have a number of people coming to sit in on my classes over the next few weeks, in addition to doing tours. So take advantage of all that stuff. That's where you really get to see firsthand what it's like to be a student and make some connections to faculty and students. All right. Well, this was a great event. Thank you so much. Thank the panel, I, uh, the panelists, and 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 Lauren and and Ronan, Lauren and Ronan. Are there any final words that you'd like to add to this conversation? Well, make yeah, sure coming to out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Make sure to copy all the um, email addresses and all the other information that was presented in the chat. 
And then also, again, we are offering scholarships, $2,500 scholarships to anywhere from one to three students, high school students, high school seniors headed to college this fall. So go to our website. Again, it's chicagoemeonline.org to apply March 18th is the deadline. So again, thanks to everybody. This was great. I wish I had this in high school. Um, so um, thanks to all the panelists and Lauren and Ronan and the junior board for organizing this event. Uh, again, this was recorded. So this will be the entire conversation will be on our website starting Monday or Tuesday of next week, chicagoemeonline.org. And yes, please send us your feedback. Thanks, Rebecca. All right. Well, have a great day. Enjoy the beautiful day. And um, we'll talk soon. Happy weekend, everybody. And go Ramblers. <laughs> go Ramblers. Go Ramblers. And Northwestern women. Paul is a basketball team, right? Anyways. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>